All right, so now we've covered the vast majority of popular protests between 1780 and 1820. Before we move on to the reform crisis in the early 1830s, we're going to go over the 1820s in a bit more depth, because although there weren't any more major popular protests following the Queen Caroline affair, in 1821 and Cato Street Conspiracy in 1820, there were still a number of disturbances and political developments in the period that will become very much more relevant when we get into the 1867 Act and the 1884 Act when one has to consider the more uh, revisionist views. So, Radicalism in the 1820s There was a noticeable subsidence in radical activity in the 1820s, in spite of the fact that in some regions economic distress was still present and political unions were still active. Between 1822 and 1830, there was very little radical activity due to a general revival in trade following the end of the continental system and the subsequent economic boom. Now, for those of you who don't know, the continental system was essentially uh, a plan devised by Napoleon Bonaparte of France, which prevented British tradesmen from trading with mainland Europe. So, obviously, they could only uh, appeal to the domestic market, so there was much less demand for goods, and so supply had to drop to meet this lowered demand which obviously resulted in unemployment and the increase in prices. So, this prosperity was exacerbated by a series of good harvests that lasted until 1828, noting that there had been years of poor harvests and cold winters in the years leading up to the Cato Street Conspiracy. So, Essentially, for several harvests prior to Cato Street, uh, there had been very poor harvests, which, like I just said, can lead to unemployment and raising the price of food, as there is a low dem- as there is a low supply and a high demand, so prices go up. Uh, so yeah, th- these good harvests also contribute to the lull because there was no one really. Uh, criticising the corn laws because if wheat is abundant the increased cost of bread due to the corn laws uh, wouldn't really have much more of an impact on impoverishing the working class. So there was a sharp recession in 1826 but the, econ- but the economy swiftly recovered. The Publications Act of 1819 also partially contributed to this lull, as it reduced the influence that the radical press had on the working class by making radical pamphlets and papers too expensive. So this is where the information we went over in our lesson on William Cobbett comes in handy, because it essentially demonstrates how the radical press influenced the working class. So... The Campaign for a Free Press in the 1820s There was a noticeable campaign for a free press, led by the Republican Richard Carlyle, noting that I have done Republican in lowercase, uh, which means it does not refer to the party, it refers to the Republican ideology. So, Richard Carlyle spent six years in prison between 1819 and 1825 for printing the works of Thomas Paine following Peterloo. So he's essentially protesting the uh, government's attempted repression of the press and the uh, suppression of the publications of these radical works. Obviously, Carlyle likely was also responding to the Six Acts of 1819, so the Lord of Liverpool Six Acts, which, as I said before, suppressed the freedom of the press and the printing of radical pamphlets. So, it is argued that Carlyle's emphasis on political rights rather than economic relief 
made him more appealing to the more educated middle class and the artisans of the respectable working class, rather than unskilled workers. So, the spread of anti-capitalist ideologies. It is argued by historians such as Wright and Belcham that the 1820s were an incubation period for anti-capitalist sentiments. This ideology began to blame poverty and exploitation of the workers on capitalism rather than on government policies, noting that even the Spencians had largely blamed uh, much of the impoverishment of the workers and the poor living conditions of the working class on underrepresentation in parliament on a uh, government corruption and other uh, political devices although the spencians as we have already gone over were essentially proto-marxists so these ideas were promoted in newspapers such as the crisis the pioneer and the poor man's guardian all of which were fairly cheap. Ergo, the working class had access to them. And I've included a uh, page of the Pullman's Guardian to the right. So, these were still proto-Marxist ideas, as the Communist Manifesto would not be written until 1848. And as we know, it was written by Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx. As Heinlein said, the two greatest frauds and disheveled mystics in history. Sorry if you like them, but it's my opinion. So, middle class radicalism. It was in the 1820s when middle class radicalism first took root. It was in this period that the term liberal entered the common middle class political discourse. And it would be this radicalization of the middle class that would force the government into making concessions in 1832 with the Great Reform Act, which in itself extended the franchise to the middle class, as I believe it was the uh, 40 shilling freeholders who got the vote in the boroughs because there had formerly been an ununiform voting franchise in the boroughs. Uh, and yeah, pretty much this radicalization of the middle class provided the impetus for the disturbances that would culminate in the 1832 Great Reform Act. And you have to think, when we get on to it, uh, there was talks of a bank run. Are the working class really going to be able to participate in a bank run if they don't really have many savings? Obviously not, it's going to be the middle class who are going to be withdrawing all their funds from the banks, so something you may not have thought about. So, the short breakout of violence. This is the main uh, bulk of what happened in the 1820s, other than Cato Street and the Queen Caroline affair. They're not majorly important for your essay, but it's just good to know what was still going on. So, in 1821, a crowd of 3,000 ironworkers and coal miners refused to disperse when requested to do so by the yeomanry, large gatherings having been made illegal by the Riot Act, which is one of Lord Liverpool's six acts of 1819. And a fight ensued, where two miners were killed and several yeomen were injured. So, that's 1821. Moving on to 1822... A power loom was destroyed in Shipley, so more machine smashing slash Luddite disturbances, although probably not caused by the Luddites themselves. So, between 1823 and 1824, Scottish workers were brought to Liverpool to replace the rope makers and sawyers, whom were striking to... whom were striking... Two of these Scotsmen were killed, and there were breakouts of arson. Now, if you are familiar with the kind of working class trade union history, you'll know that the derogatory term scab was used to refer the, to these men who were working and taking the jobs of the workers who were striking with the union. 
so it's something that you can put in your essay if you want. 1825 to 1826, the depression in the cotton trade caused rampant unemployment in the northwest. As a result, this culminated in the destruction of over 1,000 power looms around Blackburn in April. There was then a confrontation with troops which resulted in the killing of several of seven machine breakers at Chatterton and three elsewhere. These disturbances spread to Manchester, um, a town notorious for its reforming history. We go on to Manchester quite a lot over this course. Uh, spread to Manchester where a mill and several bread shops were burned down. There were more machine smashing in other regions and it must be noted that these events were not ideologically driven. They were indeed a genuine case of violence born of despair. That being the famous quote we recently said was uttered by Henry the Orator Hunt. So 1829, during April, several, several weavers were shot by soldiers, guarding 16 men whom had been taken into custody after factory machinery had been destroyed in Rochdale. In retaliation, four weaving shops in Manchester suffered attacks and 150 power looms were destroyed, with the factory also being burned down. So, the new trade union activity. Some historians speculate that the subsidence in radical activity in the 1820s was a result of growing non-violent trade unionism. This trade union activity usually took the form of strikes as opposed to violent protest. The trade unions actually specifically favoured non-violent protests as it meant they could operate within the bounds of the law. Because obviously, as we know, if they were going to be engaging in radical activity, I doubt the Liverpool administration would have much problem with banning them altogether. And obviously the unions make a lot of money, so they do not want to be banned. They want to stay operating so they can bring a profit to those running it. So, now we're moving on to the swing rights of 1831. These are probably the main... Uh, Thing to take away i know it's not specifically the 1820s but we're not going to really get much into them when we do the reform crisis so they're essentially the tail end of the period and they are very important so the swing riots were a series of disturbances caused by agricultural laborers which broke out in kent during the summer of 1830 they swiftly proliferated to the rural areas of southeast England, where they continued until autumn of 1831. They were similar to the Luddite disturbances in the sense that they were named after the myth, after the mythical Captain Swing, whose name was signed at the bottom of threatening letters, and he was supposedly the leader of the movement, similar to Ned Ludd with the Luddites. So, the forms of swing protest, we had writing threatening letters, machine smashing, arson, abusing or maiming pets or prized animals, very cruel, uh, assaulting poor law overseers, who are essentially the poor law guardians of the day. Emmeline Pankhurst was a poor law guardian, in fact, that's why she started the suffragettes, but I digress. Uh, they demanded lower tithes, which were essentially taxes to pay for the local church. Uh, they would engage in strikes, as we previously men mentioned, and they would attack union scabs. So, and just a quick note at the end, these protests were instigated as a means to demand higher wages for workers. Most of them were, some of them weren't, we'll get on to that in a moment. So, what were the reasons for the swing riots? And I've got a lovely picture of Earl Grey to the right, the Whig Prime Minister who passed the 1832 Great Reform Act. 
show rural poverty in the south caused by both population growth and unemployment was a reason for the Sun riots. Another one, the operation of the old poor law and thus the dissatisfaction with the rates that the workers paid them. So they weren't massively happy with how the old poor law was operating. Remember it was very old at this time, having been introduced during the Tudor period by Queen Elizabeth I. The breakdown of paternalism, which essentially means like the breakdown of social order where the working class kind of have a deep respect for the middle class and really the aristocracy primarily, uh, but really those who were above them in society and it was believed by conservative doctrine that the aristocracy and royalty had a duty to care for the working class kind of like a father, so that's what that means. There were poor harvests between 1828 and 1830 which induced a pessimistic attitude onto the newly impoverished working class. So, as we previously said, uh, subsidence and radical activity when there are good harvests, when the bad harvests are back, and radical activity returns in the form of swing riots. Uh, that makes you think, are they generated by poverty? So, revolutions abroad, being the ones that happened in France and Belgium, and the new Whig government, led by Earl Grey, caused for a turbulent political atmosphere, which essentially made the working class feel as though they could get change done. And the middle class, uh, important to note, as many of the swing writers were middle class. So, local struggles, such as impoverishment and unemployment, also were reasons for the swing riots remembering the famous quote, idle hands are the devil's tools, so, or idle hands do the devil's work, whatever one you prefer. So, our conclusion on the swing riots. The swing rioters generally hailed from the respectable working class, as opposed to the rungs of society, which was the previous consensus. So, for a long time, people thought that the swing rioters were the impoverished working class, but that wasn't true, it's more respectable working class and middle class. So, the philosophy that lay behind the swing riots was deeply conservative as opposed to being revolutionary. This is because the demands of the men were very backward looking and they sought a return to the pre-industrial economy where lost rights would be returned, wages would return to what they had been, and levels of poor relief would return to their former levels. The rioters posed little threat of revolution, obviously because they were conservative and not radical. The government responded to the swing protests in various ways depending on what activity the protesters participated in, remembering that there were a multitude of ways in which the swing rioters actually engaged in protest. Some more violent riots were suppressed by the military, while the more peaceful demonstrations were subdued by the passing of political measures and the use of the judiciary, who gave the rioters very harsh sentences as a deterrent to future uh, uprisings or future activity. Not uprisings, that's not the correct word. So, the swing riots eventually ceased due to intense government repression and the punitive measures imposed on the rioters. Following the repression of the swing rioters, there were still some disturbances after 1831 in the hopes of passing a new poor law, which they did in 1834, two years after the Great Reform Act. So, that's it for the period between the bulk of popular protests that we covered last time with the 1780s to 1820s. Uh, this is just to provide some continuity before we get on to the reform crisis of the early 1830s next time, where we'll be talking about government legislation, the Duke of Wellington's administration, Lord Liverpool's uh, administration, and finally, the administration of Earl Grey and uh, 
Bertrand Russell's great grandfather, uh, Finality Jack, or maybe just normal grandfather. I'm not sure at the moment. Anyway, that's it. We'll be going on to the great formats next time. Thank you.